uh, we are going to start. I request uh, Reverend Rajan to begin the meeting with a prayer. Reverend Rajan is the eco director of Madhuri Diocese. Please. Do. Yes. Let us pray. Almighty and uh, loving Father, created of heaven and earth, how very good and pleasant when Hindus live together in unity. Dear Lord, as we gather together through Zoom for this meeting, we praise you, Lord, for this day. Lord, we come to you today asking for your guidance, wisdom, and support send us you, the Holy Spirit, to be guide us and give us. Lord, we thank you for our Department of Ecological Concern in Church of South India. Special pray for the Director, Professor Dr. Matthew Koshe Punakat, sir. It's a very crucial time for this time has initiated and organizing a fruitful conduct a climate change campaign for today through this Zoom. Especially we pray for today's resource person, Inspector Chandra Bhushan Shah is going to take a lecture for this great seminar. Lord, bless this seminar. Give us this wisdom to understand topic that we are going to discuss, enlighten our minds and let your be upon us. May this lecture bring success and grow through our efforts. We need to pray for your presence being with us from the beginning till the end of this meeting. We offer prayer in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Yes, thank you, Reverend Rajan. Good afternoon to all. We welcome all of you to the fifth lecture on climate change. So today, we got an eminent person, Mr. Chandrabhushan, is a non environmentalist as well as a climatologist. So we know Chandrabhushan very well. He came to CSI Senate Center for a big program and addressed the CSI Senate. Again, he came to Odara for another program that is also for climate justice. He is a good friend of CSI and we have been following him in all the activities. He was the director of Center for Science and Environment and now he is working as the chief executive officer of iForest. I wrote I am everything in my invitation about him. Sir, on behalf of CSI, I welcome you to this program. So you can start the lecture and ask questions and our, our participants will ask questions. And thank you very much, please, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Koshi, as you rightly said. Uh, I'm an old friend of Church of South India. I, I have been invited many times. It has been my pleasure to interact with with CSI, I, I, I enjoyed uh, the dedication, especially now, maybe CSI is the only uh, religious organization with dedicated green center, uh, which is uh, increasing awareness on environmental and climate change issue. My hope is that every religious uh, affiliation in India will learn from you and set up environmental center because unless and until our religious leader, our religious organizations uh, get involved. The challenges we face is so big that we cannot do it without the help of all of us together. So thank you very much. Uh, it is a pleasure to discuss today uh, the issue of climate change. And uh, I will do that. What I'm going to do, uh, Professor Matthew, is that I'm going to give a short presentation of about uh, 15 to 20 minutes. And uh, then I will uh, open the floor for question and answer. And that's how we are going to, going to move ahead. So I'm going to share my screen uh, for, for the presentation. Can uh, someone allow me to share the screen, please? You can, you can share the screen also. Yeah. So I have... I have titled my presentation as a planet in crisis, but a message of hope. Uh, it is very important that 
while we are giving a message of crisis and it is a crisis i think it is important to understand that what covid has shown this year in 2020 what a crisis looks like and this one virus has made the world stop it has it has made all of us go underground literally but if climate crisis happens then covid will look like almost like a cakewalk you know think about uh, the impact covid had and multiply it by 1000 times that's what climate change will do if we do not start addressing the climate change issue uh, right away in fact i think we are late but but we should we should not lose hope and that's the message i also want to give today is that even though scientists are telling that we are late in climate action but there is a space for us there is a hope uh, that we will be able to overcome as we are trying to overcome the covid crisis i i i i want to give you a sense about where are human beings right now as a species and then i will talk about where is where are we environmentally as a planet so my first part of my presentation is to give you some idea about the state of human well being as a humanity where we are this is a map of poverty of the world in fact if you go back about 150 years back the entire world was poor in fact in 1820 we had about a billion people the population of world uh, in 1820 was about 1.2 1.3 billion and majority of people in the world were poor if we take the today's definition of poverty line then in 1800 other than the kings and and maharajas and few of their ministers and jamindars most of the people were poor so one of the thing we have to understand is from economic perspective we are much better off we are probably better off in in, in our whole history uh, today the number of poor people are far less even though the population is reaching close to 8 billion uh, we have about less than half a billion people who are poor which is still a big number but nevertheless one of the biggest achievement of human being has been that we have been able to eradicate poverty in large parts of the world india is still very poor is something that we need to work on but we have reduced poverty similarly our life expectancy has increased we are living longer the average life expectancy in the year 1800 was 30 years today on an average we live 70 years so we are not only richer we are living longer our literacy has improved in fact our illiteracy rate is less than 10% so if you look at the data again uh, in the last 200 years we have we have been more literate our children are going to school and therefore we are more educated and are we are giving less birth to children on an average in 1950 every woman gave birth to five children today this number is less than two so we are we are even reproducing less which is very important because at the end of the day population is an important factor on environmental impact whether we want to accept it or not but the fact is more the number of people we have more resources will be consumed more environmental impact will happen so historically we are again we are now reaching maybe in next 10 years replacement rate where every woman will produce just a little less than two children which will just replace our our, our existing population and we are killing less despite all the terrorism that we 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 uh, see in our newspapers and magazine the fact of the matter is 21st century has been the least violent century uh, in the human history. We are killing less. So if you look at human well-being, it is very important to realize we are richer, we are healthier, we are living longer, we are reproducing less, we are more educated, and we are killing less. Which should be really, uh, I think we should not uh, you know, discard this achievement. This is what statistics is about. If you take the data for 200 years, disaggregate the data, then you see there has been achievement in human being. But we have also become very unequal. 
the the fact of the matter is that we now in this world despite all these achievements we have super rich and we have super poor even though the poor are doing little better than what they did before the fact of the matter is that the inequality is increasing in fact the combined wealth of of the richest 1% uh richest 100 people is more than the combined wealth of poorest 50% of the people so we now have new maharajas okay 200 years back maharajas had all the wealth and rest had very little but today we now have super maharajas 100 families who have more wealth than 50% of the world poorest population now this is health of this is the state of human well being but what is the state of environment the state of the environment is that we have built all these material benefit health benefit education benefit based on extraction from environment by exploiting the environment and this is the state of natural world this is an index which is public published by wwf world wildlife fund uh, they publish it in every decade and as you can see that the global living planet index which is the state of the natural world has declined by 58% in the last 50 years so we are building all this material benefit on the basis of environmental exploitation so while we are doing very well as human species our environment is doing very badly and i think this is important to understand because this is the contradiction that we have built our economic base we have built our social welfare by exploiting the environment and there is a limit till which you can exploit the environment after that environment will not have resources for your economic and social benefit in fact degradation of environment will also ultimately lead to degradation of economic and social well being we are seeing that in in case of air pollution i live in delhi and today despite all the motor cars and big houses and money that we have we don't have clean air and similarly we don't have clean water so the fact is we have done very well as far as social and economic benefit as a species is concerned human species homo sapiens have done well they have done by exploiting environment and that environment is now biting back through water pollution air pollution and climate change you can see the loss of tropical forest in fact in the last 300 years about 250 years 250 260 years we have lost close to 30% of global tropical forest 30% of global tropical forest think uh, you know it is almost like taking the lungs out of uh, of a human being because forests are the lungs they produce oxygen they give us water they are the biodiversity uh, hot spot so this is the status of 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 tropical forest and this is how other species are getting extinct so we are doing very well our population is increasing we are reaching 8 billion people but the fact is in this entire thing amphib we are reducing the number of mammals birds reptile fishes amphibians in fact any other species you take they are doing very badly so while humans are doing very well our planet is doing not so good and other species are doing very badly so it is very important to understand that we as a species as we do well others are not doing very well but that's not the world we want to live in right we want a world where everyone should thrive homo sapiens should thrive and so should amphibians and other mammals and birds and reptiles and fishes all other species should also do uh, very well which they are not doing right now and this is the state of our rivers we are committing something called as hydrocide killing of our rivers and across the world this is not a problem only in india you can see rivers across the world which you know the great rivers of the world do not reach sea now they reach sea only in certain period of the year whether you take you know rio grande in mexico and usa you take orange river basin in africa south africa you you take indus basin in india or murray darwin basin in 
in uh, Australia or Yellow River Basin in China. Across the world, rivers are doing very bad. Uh, we are just exploiting the river to such an extent that they do not reach the sea and river should reach sea. River has have origin and they have destination. Their destination ultimately is sea where they must go. But because of our exploitation of rivers, uh, this is what we have done. And then we are increasing the climate. This is, we are changing the climate. This is the temperature spiral of India for the last 120 years. Just watch how temperature is increasing. You can see after 1990 what has happened. I will repeat it again. Just watch it carefully. From 1901, the way temperature is increasing. It is all right. It was fine till 1970. There's a marginal increase in temperature. And then now the temperature starts rising after 1990. And then it spirals. You can see we are, frankly speaking, in last 10 years, our temperature is increasing almost like a runaway temperature increase. This is what is happening to climate change. And therefore, it is very important to understand that we are responsible for climate change. We are responsible for extinction of other species. We are responsible for destroying very there should not be any debate on this issue i mean to say there is still uh, many climate change deniers uh, who deny climate change but the fact is the recent anthropogenic emission of greenhouse gas gases is highest in history nowhere in the history there is a record of such sudden increase in greenhouse gas emission. The concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere is unprecedented, at least in last 800,000 years. Close to a million years, the temperature of CO2 has not reached 410 ppm, which it is today right now, 410 parts per million. And the warming of climate system is unequivocal. As I showed you in the, in the spiral, if anyone says that, no, 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 climate is not warming, just show them the spiral. This is the data from India collected by official Indian Meteorological Department, which has been converted into a spiral. So there should not be any debate that whether we are causing climate change or not. We are causing climate change. The impacts are huge. So what is, what is the kind of unprecedented impact uh, that is happening uh, due to climate change? Since 1950, there has been a lot of research on climate change, even though the International Climate Treaty was signed in, in 1990s, we have good research, climate research for the last 70 years. In fact, we can even go back to 1800 when there was a research that was done on climate change, but extensive research on climate change has happened since 1950. And we now have clear data which shows that our ocean is acidifying, our sea level is rising, our biggest ice caps uh, on Earth, which is Arctic and Antarctic, are, are shrinking. The extreme weather event is increasing, the number of uh, uh, extreme weather event is increasing, and many terrestrial freshwater and marine species have started to adapt. And this is autonomous adaption. It means that they are moving to places where they can survive. Uh, example, for example, in India, apples are, apple orchards are now moving into alpine area in the Himalayas. They are now, as the snow line is increasing, as the snow line is receding, uh, the land is becoming available for apples to grow. So, even in uh, our, our species are doing autonomous adaptation. They are now adapting to changing climate to survive. What does this mean for India? I, I think it is important to understand that we are one of the most vulnerable countries in the world. Uh, we are vulnerable because of our climatic condition. We are a monsoon dependent country. It only rains for 100 hours in any part of India. 
So we do not have, you know, the perennial source of water, which is there in Europe and other places where it rains for six months in a year. In India, it only rains uh, during monsoon season. So we, in any case, are a very vulnerable climatic system. We have a very vulnerable climatic system. And therefore, we are a very vulnerable country. We are extremely populated. We are densely populated. Our population is increasing. And we are poor. And you put all of them together, we become one of the most vulnerable countries in the world. We are warming, actually, at a greater rate than global average, whereas the average temperature in the world has increased by about 1 degree centigrade. In India, it has increased by 1.2 degrees C. So we are also warming at a much higher rate uh, than the rest of, rest of the world. And consequently, we are losing more than $200 billion every year because of extreme weather events, uh, you know, uh, uh, because of loss in agriculture, water supply, many, many things. <clears throat> so our economic loss, apart from the fact that, uh, you know, the loss of life is there and loss of productivity is there, uh, we are also losing money. We are losing about $200 billion every year uh, 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 because of climate change. And our adaptation cost is increasing. In 2012, uh, we spent with limited resource, 2.6% of our GDP on adaptation. So the economic cost of climate change is also increasing. We are spending more money to save ourselves from climate change. And going ahead, uh, we, we need to spend 10% of our GDP to save ourselves from climate change. So what kind of economy you will have where the growth rate is 5% and you are spending 10% on adaptation? It's a negative growth rate. So economically also, it doesn't make any sense now for us to ignore climate change because the cost of climate change is more than the growth in economy. And therefore, you are going to have over a period of time, your real economy growth will be a negative growth. So we now have to be also, from economic perspective, start realizing that climate change now has negative impact uh, on our on our on our economic growth and econ and economic development the other major impact that i see is that we will have much more frequent crop crop failure uh, generally we have crop failure failure in different parts of india once in 10 year uh, the projection shows that it is likely to become once in 4 year uh, Coastal flooding and displacement is going to increase. Kerala is going to be heavily impacted by Kerala already is, and many parts of Kerala, uh, Kerala are below uh, sea level. But coastal flooding and displacement is going to become even more important. And why coastal flooding? Even the extreme rainfall that happened in 2018 in Kerala, and even this year, Kerala is going to get battered by extreme rainfall and coastal flooding uh, uh, because of climate change and also because of the dam mismanagement. So climate change alone is not going to, uh, is not responsible, but also the way we are doing urbanization, the way we are uh, doing the management of our dams, the way we are cutting our forest and uh, doing uh, development in Western Ghats, all these will put together, uh, will have huge impact uh, on Kerala's ecosystem. And at the end of the day, it is about people people for whom we are doing all these economic development, so-called economic development, are going to themselves get devastated uh, because of climate change. So the impacts are real. I think gone are the days when it was theoretical. We now have to start talking about real impacts uh, of climate change. It is going to make poor poorer. This is what bottom line is, that the climate change is going to make poor even more poor. Now, we need to have some idea about what is the cause of climate change, who is causing climate change, because this is important from, uh, from international negotiations uh, perspective. I have already, I'm, I'm so happy that Dr. Matthew did share my Times of India column with all of you. I hope you have uh, read my column on the Paris Agreement, but nevertheless, I just want to uh, bring out some, some facts and figures uh, about climate change. Now, this is, these are the gases which cause climate change. 
65% of climate change is caused by carbon dioxide, which is coming from burning of fossil fuel and industrial process. 11% is caused by climate change. This is because we are cutting our forest and changing land use. So cutting of forest and changing of land use also leads to release of carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide in totality is responsible for 75% of climate change. Then we have methane emission, which comes from agriculture, animal husbandry, and oil and gas industry. Oil and gas uh, we use, uh, gas as our natural gas our, as our cooking fuel is methane. And methane is 20 times more potent uh, climate change agent uh, than carbon dioxide. And then we have nitrous oxide and we have F gases, gases that we use in our air conditioner and refrigerator. They also cause huge amount of climate change. So this is the, the cause of climate change, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and F gases. These are the gases put together, uh, which causes climate change. If you look from economic point of view, then 25% of greenhouse gas emission comes from electricity and heating sector, 24% from agriculture, forestry, 6% from building, 14% from transport, 21% from industry, and 10% from other energy services. So one third of our total emission is from electricity and energy sector. Then there is one fourth is from agriculture, 20% is from industry, about 15% is from transport sector. So this is sectoral contribution to climate change. And, and therefore, if we want to solve climate change, just changing the energy sector is not going to be sufficient. This is, this is the point I wanted to make here, that we have to make changes in almost all sectors of the economy. Agriculture, building, transport, industry, electricity, every sector has to be transformed if we want to, to control uh, the climate crisis. Who are the major polluters? As you can see, China is today the single largest polluter of climate change. In fact, China now emits one third of the global emissions, which was not the case 20 years back. In 20 years, uh, Chinese emissions have just skyrocketed. Today, they, they are responsible for 33%. 32-33% of the global emission. United States is responsible for 15%. India is responsible for 7%. European Union is about 10%. And rest of the world is 30%. So frankly speaking, if you want to solve climate change, then 70% of the climate change problem is coming from six regions of the world. China, United States, European Union, India, Russia, Japan. 70% of, of the global emissions uh, will have to be reduced by these countries. And then rest of the world is 30%. Africa has very, very low contribution to climate change. So it is also important to understand where the emission will have to be cut. Without China taking leadership, uh, uh, United States, China, they both are together 50%. US and China together is close to 50%. Half of the global emission comes from these two countries. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so this is what uh, the status is as far as, uh, as global emissions is concerned. Of course, per capita emission is very low. Despite China being the uh, largest emitter, its per capita emission is half of the US. United States per capita emission is 16 tons compared to China's eight tons and compared to two ton by India. India has uh, one of the lowest per capita emissions in the world because our population is very high and most of the poor people don't emit anything. Most of the emission happens from the rich. So uh, 
our per capita emission is low, but we still have, are responsible for 7% uh, of the global emissions and we will have to do something about it. If, if I take cumulative emission because climate change, carbon dioxide remains in the atmosphere for thousands of years. Uh, if I take cumulative emission, then uh, the picture changes a little bit. Europe is responsible for 22% of all the global warming gas that has been put in the atmosphere since 1750. China is about 13%, India is 3%, US is 25%. So if you take historical responsibility, then Europe and Europe and United States are responsible for half of the global uh, carbon, greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. China is only about 13% and India is 3%. <clears throat> so from historical perspective, uh, we are, uh, uh, you know, Europe and, and, and US uh, have much to answer uh, on the issue of climate change. <clears throat> Let me come back to the last point. What is the future of climate change? How do we solve this problem? Now, this is the, rep this is the graph that came out in uh, a recent report of IPCC, uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, as you can see, this is where we are right now. Uh, our emission is close to 50 billion tons every year. This is what uh, is the global uh, greenhouse gas emission is. We are here right now, 2020. But if we want to meet 1.5 degree C temperature target, which is what scientists are saying, that we must meet 1.5 D, not two degrees, 1.5 uh, degree temperature target, then we have to start reducing drastically now. And in fact, after 2050, we will have to suck carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. We will have to have negative emissions. Negative emission means that we will have to grow a lot more forest. We will have to store a lot more carbon dioxide to meet 1.5 degree. That's why scientists are saying we are getting too late because Emitting is very easy. Sucking carbon dioxide is very difficult. But all the models are showing that somewhere from 2040, 2050, the world will have to have negative emissions. We cannot afford to put uh, any more carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. We will have to uh, start sucking uh, carbon dioxide if we want to meet uh, 1.5 C target. And this is what is required. Uh, our current emission, as I said, is about 50, 60 billion tons. Uh, if we meet all Paris Agreement goal, people have put commitments under the Paris Agreement, it will only reduce by 10 billion tons. To limit temperature to, to, to 2 degrees, it has to be 40. And to limit it to 1.5, it has to be 25 by 2030 which means that if we want to meet 1.5 in next 10 years, we will have to reduce greenhouse gas emission by 50% from 60 billion tons to 25, 26 billion tons. This is what is required. This is where we are. And this is what Paris Agreement is doing. So in my article that I wrote in Times of India, I said that Paris Agreement is, isn't enough. And this is why I said, that Paris Agreement is not enough. Because all the commitments that countries have put under Paris Agreement uh, is just not sufficient. We'll only cut down emission by 5 billion tons, though we have to cut it by 30 billion tons uh, over the next 10 years. But they will cut only by 5 billion tons. So the challenges are huge. The commitment that countries are making to reduce emissions are just too low. It, it, it's very small. Whereas we need to actually cut emissions uh, significantly. How do we do that? How do we meet 1.5? I just want to give you an example of electricity sector. Today, about 40% of our electricity comes from coal, 24% from natural gas, 4% from oil. So if you put them together, then 75%, frankly speaking, six, uh, you know, 65% of our electricity comes from coal, oil, and gas. They will have to become zero. 
literally zero. Okay, coal will have to become zero. Natural gas will have to be reduced significantly. Oil will have to be reduced secondly, significantly. And we have to meet 88% of our electricity from renewables, which is only about 24% now. Only about 24% uh, comes from renewable. But if we want to meet 1.5, then frankly speaking, 90, 95% of our energy will have to come from non-carbon source, largely renewable energy. That's where uh, our energy will have to come from. So this is the kind of transformation uh, that will have to happen. We will have to say no coal, no oil, no gas uh, in the next 20 years, 20 to 30 years. So this is what uh, the challenge of climate change is. Our buildings will have to become more efficient. Our industries will have to become more efficient. Our transport will have to become more efficient. As you can see, our CO2 emissions from industry will have to reduce by 90% from 2010 baseline if you really want to meet uh, the climate change goals. Similar changes will have to happen in the building sector and in the electricity sector. So the challenges are huge. The challenges that we face is, is humongous. But as I said, I want to end by giving you a message of hope. And the hope is that this is possible. It is possible to make that change because the renewable energy cost is going down. Two weeks back, uh, in, in an auction done for solar power in India, the cost of solar electricity was two rupees per kilowatt hour. The cost of coal power is four rupees per kilowatt hour. So the cost of renewable is going down. Very soon, the cost of battery technology will also come down significantly so that we can move from petrol and diesel car to electric cars. We are already seeing electric scooters uh, in the market. But very soon, once the battery cost goes down, we can also see uh, uh, you know, uh, electric vehicles in the market. We can make our buildings more efficient and reduce our electricity bills. So there is technological transformation that is happening, which will help us to reduce emission. But technology is not going to be sufficient. I think we also have to change behavior in human beings. And that's where I think the religious organizations will have to play a major role. Because at the end of the day, you know, uh, Mahatma Gandhi once said that we have enough to meet everyone's need, but not to meet everyone's greed. And at the end of the day, it is greed which is causing climate change. So with all the technology also, Technology can take us to, to a certain level, but beyond that, I think it is change in human morale, the moral value, the ethical value, uh, which will have to play a significant role without changing human values, which is today all about consumption, all about uh, uh, you know, economic growth. Uh, we will have to start talking about well-being. We will have to start talking about love for nature, we will have to start talking about love for other species. Now, these are the things we will have to do uh, if we really want to solve climate change. The good news is that the awareness is increasing. I think more and more people are becoming aware about climate change. And organizations like yours are, are taking leadership role, uh, which is very, very important. But more needs to be done. I think we are at the beginning of of, of increasing awareness and action on climate change, but more will have to be done uh, if we really want to solve climate change. So by this, I want to uh, end my presentation and open the floor uh, for question and answer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chandra Bhushan, for your informative presentation. We, are, we have been using your in, in the information shared by you in our meetings and we are going to do it also. So we are very much thankful to you for this information. We want to know, we have, we have implemented green protocol and other things in our church. We want to know what are the other possibilities for a church like us to do to reduce green, uh, to reduce emissions. I think uh, 
apart from the good things that we are you, you are already doing uh, in the church uh, and i'm also very happy that you you have a very robust green school program uh, where you are increasing the awareness of of children on on environmental issues uh, i think that uh, you know uh, one is uh, i'm sure that you are putting on solar panels and water harvesting those are the kind of uh, of things uh, that that you are doing but i think going ahead you will have to start talking about reducing emissions from transport sector vehicular emission how do we uh, how do we reduce vehicular emission secondly how do we recycle a lot uh, how do we recycle more and more food how do we grow more food in our own compound how do we uh, reduce plastic pollution those are the some of the things uh, that you will have to do but i think more more than that uh, you have a very important role to play in the society and uh, uh, in terms of apart from people who go to church i'm sure they are they are being uh, informed but apart from that you are leader in the society in your community you are also leaders and you need to keep talking about these issues you need to increase uh, awareness of politicians and everyone uh, about climate change you also have political power i think religious organizations are also politically very powerful and they have to inform politicians that you know this is we want you to act on climate change we want you to work for environmental benefit so i think the the list is endless you can do uh, many many things uh, both internally as well as outside thank you you can the participants can ask questions the floor is open for you you have to tell your name and the place then you can ask question Philip Robinson. Please ask questions. Sir. Yes. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, uh, Philip Robinson. Uh, so thank you for your uh, uh, talk related to this so uh, last three decades there was an uh, uh, education uh, in the field of education from the school to college level the knowledge about environment it is incorporated so there was a very good result out of that is the knowledge about climate change incorporated into the school level or into the college level anywhere or uh, what actually the need uh, the need of the hour whether they have incorporated or uh, a separate di a division is required for uh, giving the knowledge related to climate change uh, kindly give your uh, uh, views and ideas with related to the uh, an incorporation of syllabus related to climate justice or climate change thank you uh, i just want to uh, so first of all i think uh, ncrt and others have started incorporating few chapters on climate change in i think in geography and other subjects but i have a very different view on educating our children on environment i don't think children can be educated on environment in classrooms uh you know environment is to be studied outside classroom not inside classroom uh, if you really want to learn environment then children should go to feed children should be taken to forest area children should go to villages you know one of the crisis today is the children who are born in cities do not know under do not understand agriculture uh, they do not understand forestry they do not understand fishery they do not they only see animals in zoo so i think if we really want to educate our children then apart from something in textbook i think more education will have to happen outside uh, the classroom in fact i am very uh, you know vocal that education will have to move out of the classroom we have kept our children for too long inside the classroom classroom will give us bookish knowledge they will make us you know ready for competitive exam they can teach us computers 
but they cannot teach us ecosystem they cannot teach us relationship between one organism and another they cannot tell us how forest dwellers live how tribals live so my request to all of you who are educators is uh, it is time we take our children outside the classroom if we really want them to connect to the nature to understand nature and to connect to nature uh, we will have to move them out of the classroom and uh, and that's the only way we can teach them climate change and environmental protection i am you can ask questions we are you used to this program of zoom so there is some difficulty in some sections john shamo uh, bartholomew you have any question koi bato okay unmute it unmute the mic bartholomew kindly unmute uh, you ask yeah uh i would like tell to thank you, uh, dr tell your na uh, name and the uh, place yeah i'm i'm reverend bartholomew and i'm from kambatu diocese and i'm the uh, director uh, for ecological department and i would like to thank uh, uh, mr chandra bhushan for giving a wonderful uh, lecture and it was an eye opener when you said that uh, uh, the educationist and the educators should have to tell and teach the children to take the children out to the village or out to the uh, agriculture field or forest or something like that we witnessed last uh, month i think uh, we witnessed last month in sunday school she asked is tomato so many tomatoes are coming like this that's the question so uh, it was very uh, informative <clears throat> and uh, we thank uh, uh, dr chandran bhushan for giving this uh, uh, wonderful lecture and it was very eye opener and in your uh, cry, uh, this thing I I can't hear you I think the voice is breaking and uh, something some problem in his area I think there is a question uh, by miss uh, Hema Lata ah you can answer that yeah 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 uh, she is asking that what is the sustainable growth that to be taken private out. sector and public sector uh, are doing uh Uh, i think hemalata there are a uh, number of initiatives uh, that is already happening where companies are developing uh, their sustainable development plans and and implementing it but the number of companies who are doing sustainable development plans are very few in numbers uh, you know we need more public and private sector companies to have serious action plan on climate change uh both in terms of reducing emission as well as in terms of of adapting uh to climate change so there are good examples of uh public and private sector companies who are uh, doing work on climate change but lot more needs to be done john samuel from totokade kindly admit senate center please admit john samuel from totokade he wants to say something sir uh, i'm john samuel from thotugudi uh, actually you said that uh, you can do something outside from the church also for uh, the climate justice and all so in the uh, present political uh, scenario uh, as a pastor it's for it is uh, something difficult for us uh, to extend our uh, climate justice outside the church because uh, the politics is giving, giving a different color if we uh, say something so it's not that easy for us to reach i you know i i just want to say that uh, uh i was in varanasi a few years back and uh, i was invited by the hindu priest of varanasi to talk about 
uh, river pollution, Ganga pollution. And uh, I was very surprised to see that in that uh, religious gathering in Varanasi, you, you know, uh, we had uh, our leader of the mosque, uh, leader of the church, uh, and the leader of the local Gurudwara, who was also there in that religious congregation. Uh, where uh, I was invited to speak. So I think at the political level, there is difference, but uh, I'm, I'm quite sure that when religious leaders meet together, uh, there will be uh, quite convergence. And, you know, you, your Church of South India is taking leadership in green movement, which I'm sure many other uh, religious affiliations are not. But I'm not sure how many... Uh, you know, I'm not sure the Church of North India actually knows how much work you are doing. You know, you have a green handbook. You know, when I, I got that, uh, when Professor Dr. Matthew sent me that green handbook, I take it, whenever I, I'm invited, I do take it and show to people that religious organizations of any affiliation at the end of the day will have to play a significant role in changing human moral. Uh, technology cannot change. Government cannot change. You know, at the end of the day, religious play, religion plays a major role in our lives. And uh, it is important that the message goes out from all religious institutions that, uh, that change is required in our moral values as far as environment is concerned. So my, I will still encourage you to engage <coughs> despite a difficult political situation and, uh, and see how it happens. Any other question? Sir, hello. Is it audible, sir? Yeah, tell your name, please. Uh, sir, I'm, I'm Nisha Anjika from Kerala. I'm from Madhikela Diocese. Uh, sir, uh, thank you very much for your beautiful presentation because it's for the first time that uh, we have um, uh, 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 the special theme like crisis and hope. Uh, it's great, sir. Uh, within this uh, short period, you have uh, gone through, you know, uh, uh, the urgencies of the time and uh, at the same time you brought us the hope. It's it's a possible thing. Thank you very much, sir. And one is uh, one one uh, small doubt that I have is, uh, sir, uh, you've said that uh, global living planet is declining. Uh, is it the settlement area is decreasing? And another thing is that, uh, sir, as you're an expert, as you've gone through various models, do you have any models uh, that the Kerala should adopt? Do you have any suggestions for that? And uh, um, another thing, as you said in your uh, discussion, is that uh, uh, reducing the carbon dioxide emission and uh, going for nuclear energy, is it an option, sir? And, uh, um, uh, and uh, do we have to concentrate on the theme, uh, reducing carbon um, uh, footprint or uh, uh, justice for all? Which one? Which one we have to concentrate? Thank you, sir. Uh, I think... Uh... I don't think we have a choice between justice and climate change. They both will uh, have to go together because there's also an issue of climate justice. The issue is climate, just, climate change is going to impact the poor the most. So, uh, you know, the rich can still, uh, you know, do something to adapt. But poor uh, will, will suffer the most because of climate change. So there is an issue of, of climate change justice itself. And uh, so they both will have to, we, we have to make sure that as we are reducing carbon dioxide, as we are closing down fossil fuel industry, the poor doesn't suffer. But the justice element and the climate change, uh, both will have to go together. We do not have a choice of saying we will do justice and climate change. Uh, you know, uh, we will give priority to one over another. That's not an option. Now we will have to uh, make sure that justice is delivered as well as climate action uh, is done together. As far as Kerala is concerned, uh, you know, I have written a lot about uh, after the, uh, the floods in Kerala, I had written uh, a lot on what Kerala needs to do. And I believe that uh, uh, one of the, the first thing Kerala needs to do is to uh, seriously look, look at Western Ghat and Gadigal report and Western Ghat uh, how uh, it is important to protect Western Ghats and what impact uh, Western Ghats has on the overall ecology of Kerala. 
So people who have opposed uh, Madhav Gadigal report uh, have a very short term view of history, I believe. Okay, uh, you have to have a long term view of history uh, uh, to to understand there are some very important uh, part of that report that needs to be adopted. Uh, Kerala is a very very sensitive ecosystem. Okay, historically uh, that ecosystem has to be has already been modified a lot through rapid urbanization uh, that we see in Kerala, but uh, there is still chance and hope to. Uh, save some part of of the natural world. So one, my recommendation is to uh, look at Madhav Gadigal report seriously rather than uh, to stall it. Uh, second, my my recommendation has been that uh, urbanization will have to be looked at. Kerala is the most urbanized state in India, and the way we are building homes and and malls and roads and bridges. Uh, we are not taking into consideration the you know the the watershed or the ecosystem so even urbanization will have to be uh, looked at uh, very very carefully uh, in kerala i also think tourism pressure will have to be reduced uh, there is nothing called as unending tourism uh, you can't have uh, keep increasing the number of tourists there has to be some control on number of tourists especially in the backwaters so th there is, I have written a lot on what uh, Kerala needs to do uh, as far as uh, uh, environmental protection is, is concerned. And uh, I'm quite uh, hopeful that the consciousness will increase and uh, people will take it seriously because you have gone through a lot in the last few years. Uh, the floods have shown, if you take COVID now, think about it, every year since 2018, uh, you had floods, you had COVID, you again had floods. Nipah. Uh, uh, sorry? Nipah. Nipah. Nipah virus. Nipah virus. Yes. So, uh, so, so I think the writing is on the wall. This is what I, I, I tell people. The writing is on the wall. So we have to do everything... The last question you asked was on nuclear energy. I am personally not uh, in favor of nuclear energy, uh, but uh, you know I don't think much nuclear will come because renewable, renewable and battery is even cheaper today than nuclear. So I think renewable, uh, renewable energy will prevail uh, in the long run. So Kerala, in the Church of South India is the only church in India which supported Gadgil committee. So we are for Gadgil report. No, so I'm, I'm glad. I'm really glad that uh, uh, because you know, you if you have a long view of history, what is going to happen in 50 years, then uh, parts of Gadgil committee report is very important in terms of protection, and 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 we will have to support it. Any other question? <clears throat> ten minutes more. Any questions? We will wind up after ten minutes. Any more questions? I think there is a question from Philip Robinson on yes. net zero technologies. Yes. Uh, of course, I, I mean to say, see, uh, there are two things that need to be understood. Uh, you need to understand the concept of net zero. Net zero means that you will emit, but someone else will suck it. Net zero essentially means that uh, so countries are putting out net zero emission targets. They are saying that we will become net zero by 2050. It doesn't mean they will stop emission. They will they will emit, but they will try and sequester carbon dioxide at some other place. I am a little skeptical about net zero, frankly speaking, because uh, you know carbon dioxide accounting is not like financial accounting that you have a ledger sheet where you will have emission and you will subtract it. That is not how nature works. And we have seen our experience with CDM, as you know, that, that clean development mechanism that happened under uh, the Kyoto Protocol, where carbon credit was given. So you could emit and buy carbon credit to become net zero. Now, it has not been a very good experience. So while I think it is encouraging that people are talking about net zero, Ultimately, we will have to talk about zero, not net zero. Ultimately, we will have to uh, 
talk about zero itself because the graph i showed you is that after 2050 we will we will have to suck the world has to become negative emission after 2050 so the option of net zero doesn't exist much uh, so while some amount of emission should happen will happen and some amount of sequestration will happen uh, we will have to rely less on net zero and more on zero another question from satyananda peter satyanandam sir there is increase of forest 30% or more percent environment uh see uh, i didn't understand the question if you can repeat the question again peter can you unmute the peter satyananda so unmute satyananda oh yes you can speak sir good evening sir good evening sir uh, geographically uh, we heard about the forest level 30% from my, my childhood cover is about 30% yes yeah my childhood uh, we heard about school level also yes yeah now is there any increasing uh, to take a challenge of climate justice program to your side see uh, india see the the world forest cover is your right about one third of the world is forest in india yeah. it is about 23% our forest cover is about uh, 23% uh some part of the world forest cover is increasing some part of the world forest cover is decreasing for example forest cover is decreasing in amazon yes sir. uh in brazil and 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 the south south america uh, forest cover is as reducing but if we want to meet climate change goal then the forest cover has to reach about 50% 50% okay. of the world has to be under forest cover to suck significant amount of carbon dioxide uh, uh, so the forest cover will have to increase significantly okay. another question can you explain autonomous adaptation of terrestrial freshwater and noids <clears throat> so the autonomous adaptation is the process in which species start changing their lifestyle to survive uh, this is called as autonomous adaptation uh so for example i i gave you an example of apple farming uh apple can only uh you know uh, grow at a certain temperature range a very narrow temperature range is required a cold temperature range but as global warming is happening a lot of areas in himachal pradesh and uttarakhand where apple grows are becoming too warm so what is happening when farmers are moving to up and up in himalayas they are moving up in himalayas because the the valleys are becoming warmer so they are moving to alpine areas where the temperature is in that range so that is called as okay. autonomously the the species are going to survive in different uh, temperature range the other example i will give you is that as our oceans are warming certain fish species are moving away to colder those who, who who survive in colder water are moving to colder places uh, so for example in north america cod cod fish is now moving towards much more much more northern pole because cod fishing requires a uh, very cold water so species are geographically dispersing to save themselves because either the temperature is becoming what warmer or the water is becoming more acidic so this is the process of 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 moving from one place to another uh, is called as autonomous adaptation any other question so uh, i i think uh, we are at the end Uh, of the program okay. okay i let me call uh, mr ravan bartolomai from coimbatore to propose what are thanks <coughs> ravan bartolomai ravan bartolomai unmute him ravan bartolomai 
It's not here. Roland Bartholomew. He is there. He is there, sir. Okay. Please unmute him. I'm asking him to unmute. Please. Unmute Bartholomew. Roland Bartholomew, see again. Please unmute. Is there? Bartholomew. I think there is some net problem with him. Uh, sir, uh, <laughs> he cannot express, he cannot no, talk. I, I think uh, uh, just so, uh, I want to thank all of you. And we, see, you are, we, I, we are very much thankful to you for your wonderful presentation and just highly informative. And we around 55 participants already participating here. Then what we are going to do is we have already recorded it and we are uploading it to YouTube and not only CSI people, all people all over the world are going to see your presentation and we are propagating and we I have requested a green sermon from you, but I didn't get it. Now we are using it for our mission and we are circulating in our YouTube and uh, uh, in our WhatsApp groups. So sir, on behalf of CSI Senate, I thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. Thank you I, very much. I call up Peter Satyanam to a word of prayer. Thank you. Peter. Hello. Yes, sir. Let us pray. Our gracious heavenly loving Father, we thank you in this afternoon. We praising your mighty name at COVID-19. We remember each and every person, the activities of ecology ministry, those who are arranging this ministry, especially with thanks to uh, Dr. Koshi, sir, who is going to uh, affect arranging all this ministry level. We praise you, Lord Jesus. Mr. Chandra Bhushan, sir, CEO of the Environmental of the Climate Justice Program. Lord Jesus, what we heard about from him, the message of the Climate Justice Program, it is useful to each every diocese or uh, those who are heard about the on his lecture about the climate justice program. Lord Jesus, we thanks to your incarnation of the eco revelation. At uh, this eco uh, revelation, your incarnation to elaborate the entire all, Lord Jesus, your mighty name. Lord Jesus, we thanks to our Church of South India leaders of the moderator and deputy moderator, honorable secretary and treasurer. We especially with thanks to each and every diocese eco-directors, those who are participated in this afternoon, those who are here of your, lecture, your words of, from Chandra Bhushan, sir. Lord Jesus, once again, thanks to Dr. Matthew Koshin, sir, and his vision and mission about the climate justice program, entire ecological ministry, what he had uh, dreams about the ecosystem of the Church of South India. Lord Jesus, we thanks to each and every person, those who are uh, pray for the ecos, those who are of the participation of the ecos ministry uh, and uh, around us all the uh, material of the ecos. Lord Jesus, we comes to your presence. In this time, uh, what heavenly uh, angel brings to good news to the entire world, as a part of the Church of South India, uh, ministers of the Church of South India, we bring good news to everyone to change the cha climate justice program, to take a challenge about the, uh, your mighty name. Lord Jesus, once again, we thanks to uh, Mr. Chandra Bhushan, sir, and we thanks to uh, Dr. Koshi, sir, and his family members, and as Church of South India. We come to your presence, we accepted your name. In Jesus' name we pray, Amen. 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 Before closing, I would like to thank all the participants. Also, two persons are controlling the Zoom program in Senate office, Mr. Ebenezer 
and Joshua. So I am thankful to them also and all the participants and the Thank you very much. Thank you very much.